It is now safe to take off your glasses. Oh. Oh. Please, everyone, to be quiet so you can enjoy the solitude of the moment. There are no birds, and feel the breeze blowing on the fire. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox class. It's so fantastic to be here, see everybody. It's beautiful California weather, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Whether you're here in person or online, we really appreciate you being part of the class. I um, want to remind everybody that I don't see it. Where's the book table, Dave? <laughs> That's lame. Always be ready. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I was going to brag on Dave because he's doing the book table now, but there was a book table last week. Okay. All right. Well, normally now we have a book table, which makes us a whole paradox class again, like we used to be. So when you're here in the future, there will be a physical book table um, with RTB's books. Always be ready, Dave, with the key. Um, thank you everybody for bringing treats. We have a really nice spread back there. It's all of you people that are listening online. It's not the same. You need to come and be here in person. So we want to invite everybody to bring treats. If you come to class, please bring treats. And if you can't bring treats for any reason, bring some cash, put it in here, and that helps keep the whole thing going. So well, thank you. And also, I want to mention again that um, there is a way to support Paradox class. We do have some expenses. We aren't just uh, a free-for-all. Uh, so used to be in the past, and now it is again, that if you want to support Paradox class, you can leave a check for the church, Christ Church Sierra Madre, or go on their online way of doing it, and there's a way to earmark the, the money for Paradox class. And then it goes into a fund that uh, we as a class have control over. So if that's something on your heart that you feel like you can do, we would appreciate you doing that. Um, okay, no class for the next two weeks. Next week is Easter, no class. Next week after that, Eclipse, everybody's going to be too distracted for Paradox class. So I think it's uh, um, April 7th is the Sunday, and then April 8th is the Eclipse. And if you are one of those people that think, I'll just hang out here and I'll see it a little bit, it's not the same. I went to Oregon for the one in 2017 and it's not the same. 
watching the sun get a little bit dark is entirely, completely different category than seeing a full eclipse and this big black hole in the sky where there ought to be the sun. So if you have the means and the motivation, go spend the time. It will be the thing, it will be, it's the kind of thing that on your deathbed, you will say, I saw the eclipse. It's really that amazing, which I'm trying to convince my wife because she doesn't want to go. <laughs> when we come back from cl for class on April 14th, we are going to have a new start time. We've been saying 12.15, I've been saying 12.20. It's now officially, eternally, forever, etched in stone, 12.15. So write that down. It's going to be Paradox class at 12.15 starting April 14th. Okay? Everybody got that? We've said it a bunch of times, and there's going to be people that say, you didn't tell us. Well, we're telling you. April 14th, 12.15, Paradox class. Okay, so I just want to say a couple of things about what happened with me this week. Um, four weeks ago, um, I had an aunt and uncle who were living in Palo Alto in the house they raised their kids in. Uh, he was 98 and she was 100. They moved them into, finally, my cousins moved them into a home and my uncle passed away within a few days and then my aunt passed away about two weeks after he did. So I was in Palo Alto two times in the last three weeks for memorial services and burials and um, I believe my aunt knew the Lord. I think my uncle did not. At least he didn't. That's the last time that I talked to him. But I'm a firm believer that the Lord witnesses to people on their deathbed in very miraculous ways. And so I don't want to say where my uncle is. Um, it was a really good time. I had a very good time with my two cousins who don't have any kids. So my aunt and uncle have no grandchildren. But I was able to witness in sort of some subversive ways and I had some time with them and I'm really grateful for that. I got back, drove back yesterday and um, spent the day Friday on my own, or excuse me, Thursday on my own in San Francisco, which is my all-time favorite tourist city. I really had a good time just praying and thinking about all this and you know I've always been bragging on my 100 year old aunt and my 98 year old uncle and now they are very suddenly no more and they were the last of my relatives in the Bay Area. So literally my whole life I've been going up there to hang out with somebody at least two or three times a year and now that whole center for me is gone and it's a very odd disquieting depressing feeling. It hit me quite a bit harder than I expected it to. So I guess if you want to pray, pray for me, pray for my cousins that they really come to know the Lord. And uh, there's a good side to it too. Um, you know, just being alive and being still here and enjoying San Francisco when it was just a sensationally gorgeous day. There's not a greater city in the world. So Let's, uh, let's say a prayer and we'll get to Dr. Hugh Ross. Heavenly Father, we, we are grateful for those times in our lives even that are tragic, Lord, because they still focus on you, they still aim at you, they still make us grateful to you, Lord. I pray for my cousins that they come to know you. If they know you, Lord, strengthen their faith. I thank you for Dr. Hugh Ross. I thank you for this class, Lord. Help us to be really focused on you and your love as much as you and your truth. Please bless Dr. Ross as he teaches us today and each one of us as we go our way this afternoon. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Ross. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. And, uh, you know, it kind of hit me too, uh, Ross, because yesterday uh, we had a memorial for my cousin. Uh, he knew the Lord, 
I uh, was an enthusiastic supporter of Reasons to Believe, loved missions, and I uh, couldn't believe how many people showed up. And literally, we had memorial services that lasted all day, graveside, then we went to a church, then they had what they called an afterglow party. Uh, but the first two already went for eight hours, and my wife and I said, you know, everybody going to the afterglow is under 50, I think we're going <laughs> to... Because it went on to midnight, so, but it just makes the point, you know, when a saint really graduates from this life to the next life, it really is a time to celebrate, and uh, you know, we'll soon uh, be uh, with him. I remember my dad making that comment when he was dying, and uh, I said, "Dad, it's going to seem like a, just a whisper of time before I'm there with you." And I loved his comment. He says, "Son, don't make it too soon." So. <laughs> But uh, yes, I want to thank uh, the people who created that amazing video clip that we got to watch as we waited for the time to, for the class to start. Whoever did that, great job. So, uh, and I'm hoping too that the virtual people get to see that as well. But again, want to remind you, April 14th, we'll be meeting at 12:15 uh, start time instead of 12:30. Well, what we've been doing last week, we launched a new series uh, on my latest book, uh, Rescuing Inerrancy, subtitle, A Scientific Defense. And uh, the book originally, as I said last week, was going to be titled Dual Revelation. And so I spent last week basically defining what dual revelation is all about. This is a slide we ended on, how when you look at the Bible, it repeatedly declares that the Bible is a book that's inspired by the one that created the universe. It's God's word. Now we spoke it through human authors, but it is God's word. And that the universe is created by God. And in both cases, it's a revelation that comes from a God for whom it's impossible, as Paul says in, uh, you know, in Timothy, it's impossible for God to lie or deceive. And therefore the words of the Bible and the facts of nature uh, from a Christian perspective, must agree. And so I wrote the book, uh, you know, Rescuing Inerrancy, basically as a defense against a 21st century phenomena where you have conservative theologians around the world saying, we no longer can defend this doctrine uh, that both the book of nature and the book of scripture uh, are inerrant and inspired by the one that created the universe. They're basically making the point, yes, we can trust the record of nature. However, we need to reinterpret the book of scripture to make it fit what we see uh, in, the, uh, in the record of nature. And you know, the thing that made, basically motivated me to write the book was a number of theologians coming to me and saying, Hugh, you need to be aware, there's a crisis. And these theologians basically think they have to abandon uh, the traditional interpretation of biblical inerrancy because of the force of science. But they're not scientists. You're a scientist. Uh, you've been uh, speaking in seminaries all these years. You know the theology. You need to write the book. But what's wonderful is a number of those theologians have basically allied themselves. In fact, this month, we're going to be releasing a book from a historian who basically took a chapter in a book and says, I'm going to give you a 40,000 word defense of what you briefly summarize. So these theologians are basically rounding around saying, yes, this needs to be a team defense. It needs to be more than just what's coming uh, from reasons to believe. And so the point I was making as we closed last week is, uh, yes, the Bible declares that it's inspired by the one that created the universe, whom it's impossible to lie or deceive. The universe reveals God, and again, it's a revelation from the God for whom it's impossible to lie or deceive. But that doesn't mean that theology and science will always agree. Because theology is our human attempt to interpret the book of nature. Science is our human attempt to interpret the book of scripture. And we're not God. We don't know everything about what is being revealed in nature. We don't know everything about what's being revealed uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, the Bible. And therefore, our incomplete knowledge is often going to result in us having a misinterpretation of the book of Scripture 
or the book of uh, nature. And more than that, we're sinners. And so our sin, our basic tendency to rebel against God's authority uh, will cause us to be biased in our interpretation of both the book of scripture and the book of nature. So there's plenty of opportunities for theology to contradict science. And we always need to keep in mind, science is not the same as the book of nature. It's our interpretation of the book of nature and theology is not the same as uh, the book of scripture. It's our interpretation of the book of scripture. So we should anticipate that there will be ongoing debates about biblical inerrancy. So, and there always has been throughout the history of the church. It'll continue on into the future. Uh, but I hope you like how I closed last week's message is that when you read Psalm 19, that's the one chapter in the Bible that basically declares that God has given us two books, two utterly trustworthy and reliable books. But Psalm 19 also gives us an exhortation. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are being commanded to be a theologian. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're being commanded to be a scientist. And what I've noticed particularly in the United States as I speak to Christians in different churches is this idea that we leave theology to the professionals, to the theology professors and the pastors. That's not what Psalm 19 says. We're all to be involved. We're all to be enjoying the study of the book of scripture and the same thing applies to science. Don't leave it up to professionals like myself. We're all to be involved in studying the book of nature. And hey, you look at Psalm 19, it's basically implying God doesn't want you left out. It's really fun to study theology. It's really fun to study science. Don't lose out on the fun. It's for everybody. God wants everybody involved. Now, uh, Reasons to Believe has been involved in dual revelation debates literally since the very beginning of the organization almost four decades ago. And that you can go on YouTube, you can go on the internet, and you'll see these different engagements. Probably the set that's been the most effective in delineating uh, our dual revelation uh, position uh, would be these two sets. Uh, the debate I had with Peter Atkins, he was a, a British chemist, lifelong atheist, personal friend of Richard Dawkins. And in uh, fact, uh, uh, during the debate, a question came up, Peter, is there any scientist besides yourself that you respect? And he says, only one, Richard Dawkins. So, uh, and, uh, but it's a very entertaining debate. You can watch it for free. Just put Atkins Ross uh, into the search engine, it'll pop right up. Uh, but you get to see the difference between an atheistic perspective on dual revelation and a Christian perspective. And uh, you know, particularly when it comes to testing the revelations to see if you're correctly interpreting them. Uh, and one that I think uh, actually shows a little more agreement, I've had three hour long plus dialogues uh, with the British astrophysicist Paul Davies. And uh, he describes himself as an agnostic, uh, but he's actually on board with us and saying, hey, we need to test our beliefs to see if we're really properly interpreting the book of nature and uh, the book of scripture. We're hoping to have him involved in our workshop that we're gonna be having in July on the James Webb Space Telescope. We'll see how that works out. But already, you can listen to these debates. They weren't video recorded, uh, but they're audio recordings uh, that you can listen to uh, online at Premier Christian Radio. And uh, then there's this book that uh, we make available at Reasons to Believe, four different views on creation, evolution, and intelligent design. And uh, when I volunteered to be part of this book, it was gonna be titled Creation, Evolution, and Genesis. Uh, but one of the four participants, what, it, what they did is they got the uh, leaders of the four uh, largest science faith organizations to debate one another on dual revelation. And so uh, it had Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis giving a young earth perspective. We had Deborah Harzma, the president of BioLogos, giving uh, evolutionary 
uh, by all revolutionary creation perspective and a theistic evolution perspective. Uh, then we had um, uh, Myers, Steve Myers from the Discovery Institute, given intelligent design perspective, and I defended the old earth creationist perspective. So four different views, but as the book was being uh, put together, uh, what we had from Steve Myers was, look, uh, the policy of the Discovery Institute is that we do not take a stand on the Bible. We don't take a stand on Genesis. So I really can't write on Genesis. So that's when they changed the title, Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. Good news, the Discovery Institute has since changed their policy. Not, the, not any change for the organization, but they now give permission uh, to their leaders, uh, their scholars, to state where they stand personally. But they have to say, hey, this is, this, I'm not representing the Discovery Institute here, but this is where I stand personally. So they are now able to say what they think and believe about the Bible. And what I appreciate is that uh, they gave me the opportunity in this book when I responded to Steve Meyer, where I basically said, hey, we all know where the Discovery Institute stands. Steve, please tell us where you stand personally. And uh, he got permission to actually state uh, what he believed uh, personally and was very supportive. So there's that book, and it's written for a lay audience, four views on creation, evolution, and intelligent design. And you actually get to see the different dual revelation perspectives laid out in this book better than any other book that I know of that's available. Now, if you want one that's a little more theologically and scientifically uh, technical, there's this book, which is a two views book. It's uh, basically a debate book uh, between biologos and reasons to believe. Old Earth or evolutionary creation. And uh, what was interesting, uh, this was a three-year project that we had with the scholars uh, at BioLogos. And uh, you know, it began by my just asking him, okay, you insist on referring to yourself as evolutionary creationists. Everybody thinks you're a theistic evolutionist. What's the difference? And what's wonderful about this book is they went ahead and defined what the difference is. Namely, that the term theistic evolution doesn't mean the same thing today that it did 200 years ago. 200 years ago, it was such a broad definition that we had reasons to believe would fit underneath it in the sense that they say we believe uh, that the history of life on planet Earth is a long period of time, not thousands of years, but many millions of years, and that God uh, was operating uh, throughout those millions of years. And so it included a wide spectrum of views. Uh, today, it's basically taking the position most people who consider themselves theistic evolutionists basically say, we believe that God created the universe. But when it comes to life, uh, God simply worked through the natural processes in a way that we can't discern or discover or do research on. And a number of people pointed out, well, that's really no different than an atheistic position on the origin of life. And they said, well, uh, we do believe that God created the universe. And we do believe that God set up the laws of physics uh, where natural processes would produce the history of life that we, we see. And they do claim that uh, God is in control and that he set up the laws of physics, uh, but that God kind of lets the natural processes go. And in a way that can't be discerned uh, exactly how God intervenes. And so what we discovered uh, from the people at the biologos is say, well, wait a minute. We're different from these theistic evolutionists in that we accept all the New Testament miracles. We believe that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in all the miracles that Jesus performed that are recorded in the Gospels, casting out demons and healing people. Where we draw the line is on the creation miracles. We're claiming that yes, God created the universe, we accept that miracle. We also accept the miracle that God designed the universe, uh, but that's as far as they're willing to go. And so they're basically saying, uh, we hold the line on what we think you guys have reasons to believe, think the Old Testament is saying about God's involvement in creation. Uh, we're basically saying 
uh, that we take a different interpretation on those Old Testament texts, but we're with you on the New Testament. And so I thought that's an interesting uh, demarcation. They accept the New Testament miracles. And, you know, I remember sharing with them while we were working on the book saying, well, I think why you're comfortable with the New Testament miracles, they really don't reflect on creation or science, and they can't be tested uh, by scientific investigation. But I think why you're uncomfortable with what we see in the Old Testament, those are things we can put to a scientific test. And so you're willing to back up. And part of it is they take the perspective of, hey, we're not going to go anywhere where we don't have at least 90 or 95 percent uh, support uh, from established scientists doing the research. And our response to that is, well, didn't Jesus say that the door is broad that leads to uh, condemnation and narrow that leads to salvation? To expect that 95 percent or 90 percent of all scientists uh, will concur with what the Bible teaches about uh, creation and science uh, seems to be out of sync with this idea that we should anticipate that the majority of humanity are gonna rebel against what God teaches us about how we should live our own lives and wouldn't that also apply to what he teaches about uh, creation. Okay, I wanna jump in to the four broad categories of dual revelation models. And so, I mean, these books I talk about deal with four different models. There are many more models than that. Uh, but they fall into these four basic categories. Uh, the conflict model, the separate magisteria model, the complementary model, and the constructive integration model. <clears throat> now, the conflict model is a recognition, yes, there is these two revelations, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Uh, but it's a, a war or battle motif, namely that one will win and the other will lose. And so they say, yes, there's nature and there's the Bible, but they're in conflict with one another. There's a battle that's been going on and it's been going on for thousands of years and this battle will not end until the Bible knocks out nature or nature knocks out the Bible. There's gonna be a winner and there's gonna be a loser. Only one revelation will survive. And so to give you an example of this conflict model perspective, we see this pervasively throughout the young earth creationist community. And so Ken Ham, the leader of the world's largest young earth creationist organization, said this back in 2013, the battle is one between God's word and man's word, and this battle has never let up since Genesis 3. So he's basically making the point there's been a war ever since Adam and Eve uh, between uh, nature, what nature reveals, and uh, what scripture reveals. <clears throat> now, I've debated Ken Ham several times, making the point that the book of nature is not man's word. Man's word is our human attempt to interpret the book of nature. They're not the same thing. And there's no battle between the word of God and the record of nature. Yes, there is a battle between theology and science. And that battle is a good battle and that we realize, hey, where there's conflict, we've made a mistake in interpretation that should guide our research in both theology and science, where we basically say, hey, this is where we went wrong. This is where we need to correct our interpretation of uh, science or of theology and get closer and closer to the truth. Uh, but it's not just young earth creationists who take this battle motif. It's pervasive throughout the atheistic scientific community. And so we have the evolutionary biologist at uh, University of Chicago, Jerry Coyne. He's written several books on this, but in his book, Fact, Faith Versus Fact, uh, he makes a statement. Science and religion are competitors at discovering truths about nature. Science has disproved the truth claims of religion repeatedly. Now it's interesting, the only religion he's focusing on is Christianity. He basically ignores the other ones. Science has disproved the truth claims of religion repeatedly, namely the creation stories of Genesis and an awakened flood. And by the way, that uh, bracketed statement is a direct quote uh, from his book. 
Uh, it's not me uh, reading into it. It basically says it's the Genesis creation stories uh, and the story of Noah's flood that science has totally disproven. And he went on to make this statement later on in the book where he said, the greatest scripture killer ever penned demolished an entire series of biblical claims by demonstrating that purely naturalistic processes, evolution and natural selection could explain patterns in nature. And here he's referring to Darwin's book, Origin of Species and Descent of Man. Now, the problem we're facing, and one of the motivations for me writing the book, today we got dozens of conservative theologians at leading uh, Christian seminaries who basically believe this. They're believing uh, that indeed evolutionary biologists have uh, thoroughly refuted the biblical claims about creation, and therefore they're saying when it comes to Genesis 1 to 11, when it comes to the book of Job, we need to reinterpret it and take out all these literal scientific claims, basically making the argument that we have, we've misinterpreted these books for centuries. It's not literal history. Rather, it's talking about in a figurative matter, and it's basically telling us about the gospel. It's not telling us about the history of creation uh, or the flood. This is all being motivated because they're believing this claim of Jerry Coyne that indeed uh, scripture has been killed uh, by people like Charles Darwin and others. And so uh, this is again uh, why we have the subtitle, A Scientific Defense, basically making the point it's the opposite of what Jerry Coyne uh, has claimed. But that's the basis for a lot of people saying we need to reinterpret the Bible's uh, creation text. I'll just say this by a quick aside, and you'll see this in more detail in the book, that when you read Genesis 1 to 11, no other passage of scripture has got more textual clues that this is literal history. The fact that we see the days being numbered sequentially tells us we're looking at a chronology. The fact that we see in Genesis 1 the repeated phrase, and it was so, the fact that we see the evening morning uh, phrase being repeated for the first six creation days, or God jumping in and saying, it is good. This is often missed by English language readers, but in the original Hebrew, these are all textual clues to the reader. This is literal history that's being stated here. We see this in no other passage of the Old Testament. No other passage has so many repeated textual clues that this is literal history, but we'll get to that later. Separate magisterium. This is a phrase that was coined more than 20 years ago uh, by the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. And uh, he's often labeled an atheist. He personally preferred to be called an agnostic. Uh, but he was the one who was basically trying to make peace, saying, hey, we don't need this Jerry Coyne, Ken Ham war. Uh, these two books are not at war with one another where one will be defeated and one will be victorious. They're separate magisteria. They deal with different subject matter. So there's no possibility of conflict. Now the way he uh, penned this uh, is a problematic because he basically said, when you look at nature, what we're looking at nature is factual, it's historical, it's scientific. It can be trusted in its literal sense. When we look at the Bible, it's all about emotions and beliefs. And therefore, we make a mistake in thinking that the Bible is trying to communicate factual truth. Science does, but the Bible doesn't. And so as long as we look at the Bible as a, a book that talks about how we should live, how we should feel, uh, how we deal with our emotions, uh, then we're fine. There's no conflict between the Bible and the book of nature. Now, of course, he did say it was difficult to actually uh, keep them completely separate. He says, one of my frustrations is that when you look at uh, what you see in the Bible and what you see in science, they seem to have this tendency to rub up against one another, and we have to work really hard to keep them separated from one another. So at least uh, he had that uh, perspective. And we notice when we've been engaging theistic evolutionists and evolutionary creationists, the model they favor is what is termed the complementary model, which is the idea 
that they're both faithful revelations from God, but they barely overlap one another. They touch, uh, but they really don't overlap in a way that they can corroborate one another. That's the theme I mentioned last week, is that one reason why God gave us two revelations, two independent witnesses, if they corroborate one another, strengthen the testimony of each, it gives us an assurance that indeed we're getting a trustworthy revelation. But what you see, and this is predominantly coming uh, from the team of Biologos, is they're saying, we believe that both books are trustworthy, uh, but we think that they barely overlap. And so you've got John Walton with the Lost Book series, uh, the Lost World, pardon me, the Lost World series. Uh, the Lost World of Genesis 1 was the first one he brought out in 2013, but I think there's now six Lost World books. The Lost World of the Flood, uh, you know, they have the uh, Lost World of Theology, and uh, basically making the comment, we've misunderstood the Bible for 20 centuries. Now that we're actually recovering, and see, John Walton has an archaeological background, as rather a theological background, is basically making the point, with the advance of archaeology uh, in the Middle East area, we now recognize we've misinterpreted the Bible, especially what it says in creation. It's really not saying anything at all because we've misunderstood the ancients. We always thought that they cared about science and creation. They didn't care at all, and therefore it's a mistake uh, to read any science or creation, especially in the Old Testament books of the Bible. Uh, and then you've got Tremper Longman III. And by the way, I've had plenty of personal engagement with both John Walton and Tremper Longman III. And uh, you know, before he came out with his commentary on Job, I came out with mine, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. By the way, I didn't ever intend it to be in commentary. I was basically making the point. The oldest book in the Bible reveals a lot about creation and science. There's more creation and science content in the book of Job than you see uh, in the uh, Genesis creation text. In fact, it's probably no exaggeration. There's more content and creation in science in the book of Job than there is in the rest of the Old Testament. And uh, Trimper was aware that I had that book. And so my book is about 240 pages. His book is about 500 plus pages. And it's a commentary in the entire book of Job. So it's a true commentary. And I remember at one conference, he gave me a copy of the book and said, Hugh, I think you'll like this. But as I read through his commentary, what I noticed, he stripped all the science out of the book of Job. Basically saying, this is poetry. It's a mistake to read anything in this book on creation and science. But as I read through it, I could see his concern was, if we read any science in the book of Job, we're going to have a problem with that evolutionary biologists are telling us about the history of life. So once again, he was convinced we have to accept uh, this evolutionary paradigm that the origin and history of life takes place through naturalistic processes, and therefore he reinterpreted the book of Job. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful commentary as long as you're not interested in what it has to say about creation and science. The rest of it, I really appreciate and enjoy. He really gets into the debate about the problem of evil between Job and his friends. I uh, love what he's got to say about that, but it did concern me that he basically stripped all the science out and repeatedly said, it's a mistake to read any science into the book of Job. And so again, it's this idea that there is a tiny bit of overlap and say, so, well, where does it overlap? Well, from their perspective, they do agree with us of reasons to believe the Bible makes explicit statements that God is the creator of the universe. He creates the universe. And in that sense, he's the creator of everything. Uh, but they leave it completely silent on what it says about any creation miracles beyond that point. Now, I do want to talk about the other extreme, which is the fusion model. <clears throat> and this is the model uh, that everything that science says about nature is also stated in the Bible. And everything the Bible states about uh, theology is also present uh, in the book of nature. There's total overlap. Well, there's total overlap. They're not independent witnesses anymore. So you lose the tool 
of cooperation. And there's plenty of places in scripture where it talks about how one cooperates the other. Whether they completely overlap, that's not the case. And moreover, I think it's a real challenge to make the point that uh, everything uh, in the Bible is also stated in the record of nature, and everything in the record of nature is also stated in the Bible. But I can't tell you how often I've gotten an unsolicited book manuscript from somebody trying to make this case. And so you read the book and they say, oh, this passage talks about protons, this passage talks about neutrinos, this passage talks about quantum physics, this passage talks about general relativity. And it's like, and that's why I put a chapter in the book. This is kind of what the Muslims do with the Quran. They read stuff into the book that the book is really not stating. You also see this in Hinduism. Matter of fact, there's a chapter in the book where I say, once you get outside of Christianity and Judaism, you have these major religions where they engage in something either equivalent to this fusion model or what I call the hard concordus model where they claim that the overlap is not just 10% or 20%, we're talking 60 to 80%. Huge overlap. So I'll give you one example of how that's done in Islam. They say, hey, our book has a lot to say about science. Are you aware that the Quran actually predicted that men would walk on the moon? And I say, well, where's that in the Quran? Well, if you look in the Quran, you'll find that there is a surah where it talks about a man. And then you'll go five pages later, there's another one that talks about the moon. So they say, hey, men will walk on the moon. Uh, but there's nothing connecting the sentence about the man with the sentence about the moon, and there's several pages apart from one another in a completely different surah. But that's their whole point. Uh, and, you know, what I write about in uh, rescuing inerrancy, they go beyond that and say, the Quran predicted pulsars because there's a phrase in the Quran where it talks about the piercing star. Well, you could interpret the piercing star to mean all kinds of things. And by the way, quasars really don't pierce and uh, you know they're, they're pulsating, so why doesn't it mention multiple piercings? It's just the piercing star. So, and then they go on to say, hey, uh, the book actually claimed that in modern days, we'd all be traveling in airplanes. And so if you read the book, I talk about how they cite a passage where it talks about someone being whisked from one location to another location that's very distant. And they said, well, that means uh, that they had to get there by airplane, therefore predicted air travel. Well, I mean, you've got a, a passage in the book of Acts uh, where it talks about the translation of uh, one of the apostles uh, to speak to the Ethiopian. It doesn't tell us that he got there by air travel. Uh, you know, somehow he got there. And matter of fact, when you read the Quran, it's not even clear if it's referring to a human that's alive or a human that's dead. If we're talking about a dead human, then you could travel a significant distance because you're not limited uh, by the laws of physics. Now, at least once a week, I get a letter or a manuscript uh, where from a Christian who's basically saying we need to do that with the Bible. Basically look into the text and then they begin to make all these connections. So they make the claim, but I got one manuscript where it talked about hundreds of passages in the Bible that dealt with Neanderthals and Homo erectus. But again, it's a lot like what you see the Muslims doing, where they're basically taking these isolated words and putting a huge amount of interpretation into him. You know, the unique factor about the Bible is it's specific. The reason why it's so easy to do this with the Hindu Vedas, the Buddhist commentaries of the Quran, if you look at those books, they're written in a very vague style. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to interpret what it's really addressing because the purpose it uses is very vague language. Uh, what has struck me when I picked up the Bible for the first time for a serious read is how radically different it was from the Quran, the Hindu Vedas, or the Buddhist commentaries. It was direct, it was specific, it gave names, dates, and places, and so it was very specific about the science, the geography, and the history, which means you really could engage in some form of concordism where you weren't making these huge leaps of stretch. 
I see that I'm out of time, uh, so next week we'll get into the moderate concordist debate uh, and the soft concordist debate and the hard concordist debate and the different kinds of concordism that we see in the Christian community, scientific concordism, historical concordism, and uh, moral concordism. But I also want to jump into uh, a major event that took place in the 1970s, uh, namely 300 theologians, over 300 theologians from all of the world, from all different Christian denominations, got together and they dedicated an entire decade to studying this doctrine of biblical inerrancy. So I'm going to give you a historical overview of what happened there. Uh, you know, I was active on the church staff when all this was going on. Uh, people at Fuller Seminary uh, were involved in this uh, project and uh, just what the outcome was. Uh, an amazing piece of research that totaled 2,000 pages of commentary. Uh, however, they came up with a creedal statement that was only pages long. So very similar to what happened with the Westminster Confession and the Belgian Confession. So we'll get to that. April 14th, yeah, we're going to be having a two-week uh, hiatus. Uh, this room, room is going to be used for an overflow room next week uh, for the uh, uh, expected high attendance that we're going to be having for Easter. And then the week after that, yeah, we're going to be at the eclipse. So I'm taking my telescope over to Texas and... We're praying that there won't be rain. And uh, you know what was interesting? Uh, when uh, I first became a Christian, I was involved in all these astronomy clubs. And uh, what we were doing is we would pray it would rain in the daytime and it would be clear at night. But then I realized there's probably more Christians praying the opposite, that it would rain at night and be clear during the daytime. So, you know, it kind of led to an issue. Whose prayers does God listen to when you've got Christians uh, both saying completely different uh, things to God. Anyway, let me uh, take it for questions. So, uh, and as usual, we'll take questions from people that are here in person and alternate with people who are participating uh, with us online. And uh, tell your friends. They can go to paradoxes.org and uh, they can participate online. And I can tell you this, our online participants are literally all over the world. Looks like we've got an online question. We do, Hugh, thank you. From Thomas Longo, an unrelated question, but that's okay. Uh, Dr. Ross, what do you know about jumbos, the Jupiter mass binary objects that orbit in the void of space? What is their likely origin and how do they impact RTB creation models? Yeah, good question. And this is recently is showing up on the internet and uh, in scientific papers. Uh, astronomers are now discovering isolated planets, planets that are not orbiting stars. Now, we understand that planets form as a result of stars uh, condensing and producing a disk of debris, and the debris disk forms a planet. Uh, but all along, astronomers uh, knew uh, that in planet formation, there is a distinct possibility that some of those planets will be gravitationally ejected from their planetary system. So literally for 40 years, astronomers have been expecting that there will be planets orbiting in interstellar space unconnected to any kind of star because they've been ejected. Uh, but of course, it's very difficult to detect a planet if it's not orbiting a star. And so only recently have astronomers had the technology where they could actually detect these planets now, even so, the only ones they can detect are the really big ones. Uh, you know, if it's Jupiter size or smaller, uh, we're not going to be able to see them in interstellar space. Uh, but what they discovered are these uh, huge uh, planets, uh, and that the binary ones are the easiest one to detect, and that's what this is all about. They've actually found uh, two big planets uh, orbiting one another out there in interstellar space unconnected to any star. And uh, what we're seeing is what we would expect uh, given what we think is a reasonable uh, calculation to how many planets will be ejected uh, from their planetary system. So it really has no impact uh, in a negative way 
on our planetary uh, creation models or formation models. It's consistent with what we've expected all along, and we look forward to these powerful telescopes discovering more. Uh, but what they found so far are the easiest ones to find. Uh, planets much more massive than Jupiter, where you got two of them orbiting one another, or three of them orbiting one another. Go ahead. Okay, I have a question here for a... Yeah, get a little closer to the microphone. Sorry. For a lay person with a science education, including evolution, who is agnostic-leaning, what are the top two or three book of nature facts matching the book of the Bible you would share in a nutshell to open a conversation? Right. Yeah, there's a chapter in uh, Rescuing Inerrancy that tries to do that as succinctly as possible. I mean, we've got a dozen books that go into it in excruciating detail. What I tried to do in Defending Inerrancy is kind of pick what you asked for. Give us a couple of the top arguments that basically shows that Jerry Coyne is wrong about A. Uh, Darwin and other discoveries of being a scripture killer. And what I've done in defending inerrancy is basically to say, hey, look what's been discovered in paleontology, particularly with the explosive speciation events, in particular the Avalon and Cambrian explosions of life. Uh, because if Jerry Coyne is right, you're going to have these natural mechanisms. He cited natural selection and he basically said natural selection evolution. Uh, what he was referring to is that those who believe it's all naturalistic cite four mechanisms, natural selection, mutations, gene exchange, uh, and epigenetics. And basically saying with those four mechanisms, if you wait long enough, you'll see that you get new species being produced. I mean, a good example is you'll have a bird species. And if some of the birds fly over a high mountain range and settle on the other side, they'll begin to reproduce. But when they meet in the future with birds on the other side, they'll refuse to mate with them. And they call that a speciation event. And so they're very closely related, but it is true if they get separated long enough, uh, they will not mate with one another. And so that's defined as a speciation event. And so they say, well, if you wait even longer, the proliferation of species might give you a new genus. And if you wait longer, the proliferation of genera uh, will produce a new family. New families, new orders, new orders, new classes. Last of all, you're gonna get a new phylum. A phylum refers to a basic body plan. So for example, we humans are part of the chordate phylum. That refers to all animals that have a long neural cord. That would include all the vertebrates. So all the reptiles, birds, and mammals uh, the, uh, 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 are included. Uh, the fish are in there, but it also includes a lot of invertebrates, creatures that don't have a backbone but got a long neural cord. That's a basic body plan. The problem, as the atheist paleontologist James Valentine and his uh, colleagues have pointed out, when we look at the Avalon and Cameron explosions, we see the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a purely naturalistic perspective. We don't see the proliferation of species first, we see the proliferation of phyla first. The phyla, and then secondly, the classes, and third, the orders. Last of all, we get the proliferation of species. It's the exact opposite of what you'd predict from a naturalistic perspective. Now, he stops there. What I've added in defending uh, and rescuing inerrancy, it's more than that. The phyla show up simultaneously and uh, they show up at the beginning of the event and they show up the very moment that the chemistry and physics allows them to exist. So for example, with the Cambrian explosion of life, the moment oxygen hits 10%, you've got 50 plus phyla showing up. And they don't show up over a period of 50 million years they all show up at the beginning of the Cameron event. Now, it took a long time for those discoveries to be made. The one about the oxygen, for example, has just been discovered in the past uh, 18 months. Uh, so, but it's making the point, and it was James Valentine himself has said, this is counter to a naturalistic perspective, and it's making a materialistic interpretation of the history of life 
uh, more challenging, more difficult, and more attractable as we learn about those events. Hey, that's one example. There's several more uh, that you can easily share uh, with people without getting into the technical details. But hey, if you want the technical details, there's a dozen books that we've printed that I can recommend. Okay. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Val Durham here says, has the James Webb Space Telescope proved that black holes are not real and that the standard model is out? And I want to add my own question on the end of that because if you read a lot of the popular science articles, even the age of the universe is off by a factor of two based on what we're getting from James Webb. Can you comment on all of that? Okay, well, in terms of the latter, it had nothing to do with the James Webb. But yeah, there is this paper has been published claiming we've been wrong about the age of the universe. It's not 13.8 billion years, it's double that. Uh, however, the entire paper is based on the belief uh, that the energy and light as it travels through space gets tired. It's the tired light hypothesis. And uh, I dealt with that even in the first edition of A Matter of Days, a little more detail. Uh, the bottom line is almost 40 years ago, the tired light hypothesis was refuted. We don't see that when we look at the spectra of distant stars and galaxies. We see no evidence that light tires as it travels through space. And if that's the case, the whole foundation for the paper has been discredited. And uh, you know, there's another reason why I was shocked that the paper got published. Not only was it based on something we know has been wrong for 40 years, it's like, what do you do with the dozen plus other measurements we have that the universe is 13.8 billion years old? <clears throat> so the claim that is double the age, you need more than one piece of evidence. You need to find some way of refuting uh, the other dozen plus methods that we have there. And in my opinion, those methods cannot be refuted. So uh, it really is 13.8 billion years old. In that sense, I'm a young universe astrophysicist, not an old universe astrophysicist. <clears throat> now the other claim about black holes uh, is quite interesting. Uh, there's a paper that's been submitted to astronomy and astrophysics that basically addresses this issue. And uh, it's not yet been published. However, astronomy and astrophysics has already indicated the paper has been accepted for publication, but it's still in the peer review process. Uh, but that tells me that the basic claim of the paper is sound. And the claim of the paper is uh, they looked at a galaxy that was discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it ranked as the brightest galaxy we could see in the early universe. And therefore, it became a target for the James Webb Space Telescope. So the James Webb Space Telescope uh, spent, there's two papers published on this. And by the way, I got an article coming out on this. It'll be posted in late April, uh, late uh, early May at the latest. Uh, so it's already in our editorial system, um, basically reviewing uh, what these two papers are saying and basically saying, we know the reason why this is so bright and, uh, and basically made the point that uh, our, their measurements show that the stars responsible uh, for this bright galaxy are stars that are very massive. Uh, running from 100 to more than 500 times the mass of our star, the Sun. That's a shock because the biggest stars we see in the nearby universe are 60 times the mass of our star, the Sun. So either star is much more massive. But this has been anticipated because theoreticians have already made the point that we know that the universe begins with just hydrogen and helium and a trace amount of lithium. And that leads to the possibility that the very first stars uh, could be far more massive than the most massive stars that are possible today. Because of other elements beyond lithium, uh, it's impossible to get stars that massive. But you can get them that massive if you have nothing beyond uh, lithium uh, in the periodic table. And basically they're making the point, it appears that in the early universe, the unity universe efficiently makes a large number of these stars. And the, so you've got these star clusters with stars that are like 200, 300, 500, 600 times the mass of our star, the sun. 
That alone explains the brightness of that galaxy because the brightness of a star goes up with a fourth power, well, technically, the 3.9th power of its uh, mass. So to make a point, a star that's twice as massive as the sun will be 16 times brighter. So it basically says, hey, if you push the mass up, you really dramatically increase the brightness. And also, if you've got thousands of stars that are, say, 200 to 600 times the mass of our star, the sun, they're going to coalesce and make black holes. So it explains why this particular galaxy has a black hole that's more than a million times the mass of our star, the sun. If you've got thousands of stars uh, that are hundreds of times the mass of our star, the sun, it's almost inbe- inevitable. You'll quickly get a black hole that big. And given that this is a galaxy that's uh, less than a billion years after the cosmic creation event, that black hole will be sucking in huge quantities of matter uh, in that galaxy. And that's the brightest thing we see in the universe. When matter is being sucked into a black hole, as it approaches the event horizon, that matter gets converted into pure energy with 10 to 42% efficiency. And to put that in context, when a star converts hydrogen to helium, it converts matter into energy with 0.07% efficiency. So that explains why our sun is so incredibly bright. Uh, But with a black hole, you get a brightness that's hundreds of times greater than what's possible uh, in terms of conversion of matter and energy. So So this galaxy has these incredibly bright stars, thousands of them, and in addition to that, it's got this supermassive black hole that's sucking in huge quantities of matter and converting that matter to energy. So it explains why we're seeing exceptionally bright galaxies in the early universe. We don't have to change the physics of black holes. We don't have to change the physics of stars. We don't have to change the physics of galaxies. Uh, The primary paper uh, that got submitted to astronomy and astrophysics basically ended with a statement, there's no need to change or alter Uh, the Big Bang creation model. It's sound as is. We now understand why we're seeing these things in the early universe. I'm going to be speaking on this in our workshop in July. We're doing a workshop on what has the James Webb Space Telescope discovered and what are its theological implications. Incidentally, I'll just close with this. One reason why there's such a strong push to claim that James Webb is requiring a refutation or an alteration of Big Bang cosmology is that the uh, scientists pushing that are well aware that if it's Big Bang cosmology, there's a beginning to the universe and the universe has been designed by that beginner. So the theological implications are driving a lot of this controversy that's going on. Yes, Nancy. Hi, Hugh. With your heart for evangelism, I thought of you this morning with something that happened, and there's a question related to this. As I was getting out of the shower, I um, heard my doorbell ring, and so I thought it might be a neighbor, so I wrapped a towel around myself and looked, <laughs> looked through the peephole, saw a man standing there that I didn't recognize. So I thought, I'm not going to answer the door, but as I was standing there looking through the peephole, a p- piece of paper was being pushed through the crack in my door. And um, when I looked at the paper, I found out it was an invitation to the local um, Kingdom Hall from the Jehovah Witness man that was standing at my door. <laughs> and so, um, anyway, it just struck me again, you know, about how very faithful some of those uh, in, in the cults are. I heard a statistic sometime recently about the average um, amount of evangelism average Christian does in the United States. And it was incredibly low, and um, especially those that regularly share their faith. Um, have you heard uh, a recent statistic on all of this? It got me curious this right. morning with my visitor at the door. Thank you. Yeah, good question. And yeah, I cite those statistics in the book, Always Be Ready. Uh, and so, for example, when I first was employed here at Christ Church Sierra Madre as a minister of evangelism, the statistic, and then we're talking 47 years ago, um, that uh, 20% of Christian adults who regularly attend church 
had shared their faith with a non-Christian over the past year. Okay, now 10 years ago, uh, Pew basically said that number dropped to 10%. The latest Pew survey puts it at 5%. So only 5% of Christians who regularly attend church, and these are evangelical Christians that regularly attend church, had shared their faith uh, with a non-Christian adult in the past year. So what you're saying is correct. The statistics have really dropped. Now, it is true that uh, evangelical Christians are still quite active in sharing their faith with children and with students. But the survey was, have you shared your faith with a non-Christian adult? So it's gone from 20% to 10% to 5% in less than half a century. That's not good news for the American church. <clears throat> now, you made the comment about the Jehovah's Witnesses, how faithful they are, literally going door to door to share their faith. Now, uh, there are many Christian cults. I mean, you've got Christian science, you've got the Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got the Mormons, uh, lots of cults, uh, Christadelphians. And uh, what they do is they take the Old and New Testament uh, the foundational books of Christianity, and they either add or subtract to those books. And so that's why we call them cults, because they're not faithful to what the Old Testament teaches. On the other hand, I would argue every Christian cult is a rebuke of the Christian church. They're doing something that we should be doing as followers of Jesus Christ. So I look at the Jehovah's Witnesses and saying, how they're rebuking us, they're very active in sharing their faith uh, with both strangers and people they know. Shouldn't we be doing what the Jehovah's Witnesses do? Only we'll teach the truth instead of something that's not true. Or you look at Mormonism and their emphasis on family units. That's something we Christians need to be paying attention to. And so instead of talking about all the abuses of the cults and all the false teachings of the cults, I think we need to spend some time saying, how is God speaking to us through the cults and addressing what we're missing to do as followers of Jesus Christ? So, but I'll share this with you. Years ago when I was minister of evangelism, we did what the Jehovah's Witnesses did. We went door to door. I think you remember those days, Nancy, you were part of that. So uh, we would recruit people, yeah. Uh, you know, Dave, you were part of that as well. We would literally go door to door. Uh, but I knew that people were very uh, upset about the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses that knock on their doors. So I said, if we're going to get anywhere, number one, we got to do it without motive. We're not going to talk about our church. When the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on your door, they're trying to get you to go to their kingdom hall. So we made it a point we're not going to do anything about trying to say, hey, you gotta come to our church. Uh, so, and we basically were there just to answer their spiritual questions, but also to stimulate their spiritual thirst. And so, you know, we would have a survey that we would take of them saying, hey, uh, you know, we're wanting to know the spiritual climate of this neighborhood. Can we ask you a few questions? Um, you know, what do you think of the Bible? And they say, oh yeah, we think the Bible's God's word. Uh, have you read the Bible? Yes, I've read through the entire Bible. Can you name four books of the Bible? And almost everybody would really struggle to name four books of the Bible. And then they would finally admit, well, you know, I really haven't read through it recently. <laughs> and so that would open up some, well, you know, are, are you curious about what the Bible says? Also got an interesting thing we talked about prayer. Oh yeah, I pray every day. Well, can you define your prayer life? Well, I have good thoughts once in a while. Do you ever mention the name of God? No, no, I just have good thoughts. That's my prayer life. So again, it was an attempt to try to raise their curiosity. But we always, are there questions you would like to ask us? We've been asking you questions. Are there questions you would like to ask us? And hey, Dave and Nancy, you remember those days. Every Saturday, at least one of our teams would lead somebody to Christ on their doorsteps. But I remember one young man, he led 13 people to Christ uh, at just one home. And uh, there were 13 teenagers that all came to Christ. He went back and talked to the parents. Because he says, hey, you know, uh, let's talk to your uh, mom and dad as well. And got to lead a number of them to Christ as well. But it's making the point. We need to be active in sharing our faith. And 
I think one of the problems of why this is not happening in America, and I saw this in my home country, Canada, is that there was incredibly successful revivals in the 18th and 19th centuries. So successful that they basically concluded, we've completed the Great Commission. We need to take this overseas. And so, for example, uh, America and Canada sent missionaries all over the world. And uh, you know, as I look at the statistics for Canada, they send out 20 times as many missionaries overseas as Americans do if you count on a per capita Christian basis. The problem is they've ignored local evangelism to such a degree there's not that many uh, committed Christians in Canada. So yes, they're aggressive, sending out 20 times as many missionaries per capita as we do in the U.S., but guess what? The U.S. still sends out way more uh, uh, missionaries because they got way more Christians. And so you can't uh, ignore local evangelism at the sake of missions. Both had to be done. And then the mistake that happened, both uh, here in the United States and Canada, is presuming, hey, if we spread the gospel to our generation, we've completed the Great Commission. Nope, there's another generation coming. Every generation needs to be reached for Christ. So yes, it's remarkable what happened at those revivals in the 18th and 19th century. But every century needs those kinds of revivals, and it needs to be, take place worldwide. Yes. Hugh, there were two parts to Val's question. She was also asking about how the uh, findings from James Webb have affected our understanding of the standard model in physics. Yeah, the bottom line is James Webb has given us far more evidence uh, for the standard Big Bang model. What you see on the web is that James Webb is challenging the standard model. It's actually the opposite. And we've invited Roger Windhorse uh, to be part of our workshop in July. Uh, he's an astronomer who has done a lot of direct observational work on the James Webb Space Telescope. He's speaking all over America and the world on how the James Webb is proving the standard model to a degree we've never been able to do before. He's going to be one of our invited speakers. Well, Hugh, we are out of questions, so would you please close us in prayer? My pleasure. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you this Palm Sunday for the reminder of what you did for us 2,000 years ago. Lord, that you were willing, you, the creator of the universe, were willing to humble yourself and live a life of moral perfection in front of us and yet take upon yourself the penalty for the sins of every human being. Thank you for being willing to come. Thank you for the evidence that you've laid out before us scientifically and historically that indeed you've made an offer to trade our moral perfection for your moral our moral imperfection for your moral perfection. And Lord, how you know better than we do what's best for us. So Father, as we share the good news of Palm Sunday and the resurrection uh, next week, Lord, I pray that uh, you would give us specific opportunities with many people who don't yet know you as Creator, Lord, and Savior to make you Creator, Lord, and Savior. And help us to do that with gentleness and respect. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you.
It is now safe to take off your glasses. Please everyone to be quiet so you can enjoy the solitude of the moment. You're very over.